As many critters that have come and gone through Martin's life over the past 55 or so years of falconry and critter care, each one is still unique and still a learning experience. In work, in life, in falconry, every day brings the possibility of surprise, growth, and lessons. This is the story of a very young falcon that made all the difference in the world to one old falconer. It's one of the ways that I that I I recreate. It's one of the ways that I, I find solitude and peace to be out all by myself uh, in some very primitive country. Uh, and the way you find a falcon's nest is really quite simple. You go into what you consider good territory, where you think that, that this looks like a spot that I could find, you know, prairie falcons, peregrine falcons. It doesn't really matter what kind of falcon you're looking for. But you go into that area, and then you just find a comfortable, shady spot, park your car, uh, lay the seat back so you're nice and comfortable, have all the windows open, and you listen. And you just kind of relax, and you listen to all of the sounds of the canyons. You, you listen to the canyon wrens and the scrub jays, and you listen to the doves and the meadowlarks and all of the other songbirds in the area that the falcons feed on. And as you're kind of listening quietly, you got your binoculars and you got your spotting scope set up and you're scanning the area looking for wildlife. You're just sitting there very quietly and it's very peaceful and you get to see mule. You know, I've seen cougar. I, I had a bear track me when I was going up a canyon. Um, that was an interesting little event. I was hiking up a canyon uh, east of Cedar City and there was still uh, a good bit of snow on the ground. And so I was hiking back. It was about a two-mile hike in the snow to get back to where the falcons would be. And uh, so I hiked back there and spent some time and saw, saw mom and dad falcon and then started hiking out. I kept hearing little sounds uh, in the trees and brush, but I didn't see anything. And then as I was walking back out the way that I came, um, right alongside of my footprints was big bear footprints. And so this black bear followed me in up into the canyon, kind of keeping track of me. And as I came walking out of the canyon, uh, I, I quite sure the bear probably followed me out till I got to my car. Never saw the bear, but did, did see the tracks. And, and so, you know, this is part of the wild experiences that, that I get to have. Uh, I Like I said, I've come across while looking for uh, bird of prey nesting sites. I came across a cougar's den that had two baby cougars in it. And of course, once I found that it was a cougar den, I got out of there really fast because I certainly don't uh, want to disturb mom and her babies. You know, I've come across uh, mule deer. I've come across badgers. I've come across a, um, antelope. I've come across a lot of wildlife in my explorations. And I have walked uh, every inch of the mountains here in southern Utah. Uh, and my falconry has given me an excuse to go do that. Even before they met, the search for the new falcon would begin planting seeds for life-altering realizations in the old falconer. The search for the new falcon took Martin out of his usual day-to-day -day and back to more wild places. His encounter with the bear tracks, being alone out far from help, renewed his awareness of the dangers in the wild and the need for top physical fitness to manage well. I will be uh, coming up here uh, with a, a friend of mine and we're gonna hike up to the top of that mountain, which is all really steep and this gravelly shale stuff all the way up, loose conglomerate. And, uh, you know, we're basically about every step you take, you take about two steps forward and you slide back one step. And we'll go to the top of that cliff and uh, we'll rappel down the cliff face. And as long as there is uh, an appropriate number of chicks in the nest, if there's not an appropriate number of chicks, we leave them, we don't touch them. But as long as there's uh, 
uh, a good number where it'll actually be a favor to mom and dad not to have to feed so many. Then uh, we'll we'll pull our new uh, baby falcon. We'll raise up our new falcon and uh, and have it again as really my my falconry bird, my wildlife ambassador, and if all goes well, the the bird and I will be good friends for 20 to 30 years and by that time I I don't think I'll even be alive that that long into the future. Even with all the time he spent scouting the area and walking steep and difficult terrains, he noticed another issue. For all the regular exercise he was now doing, his fitness level was not improving. Okay, well, as you can see, it's quite a climb, but we'll get there, and uh, I'll film little bits and pieces on the way up. So you can get a little flavor of uh, where we're at. Right now, you can see the vehicles below us. We've uh, climbed a about 150 feet and we just kind of go straight up until we get there so guys just hang around a little bit we're gonna have some fun and as you can see here this is uh, an incredibly steep slope. One wrong step, and I end up just about back to the cars. So we have to be slow and careful. Make sure that each step is solid. So we don't have any extra slippage. Our females, they all, all their feet look really similar, but if any of you smaller than this one. Yep, that's what we were saying. Okay, little one. Hi, oh, baby. Hi. Right. He was the most docile, too. Uh huh. Yeah, the other ones were trying to bite me. <laughs> Yeah, well, the males are a little easier to get along with than the females are. Hi, sweetie. There you go. Oh. Yeah. Um, I think I think you got a male. Nice. I think so. I took the only one that looked a little bit different. Yeah. The other two looked the same. What are you doing, little buddy? Big chunky feet. No. That one looked the dankiest, so. Yeah. Yeah, I no. I think you got a male. It's easy to tell if they're side by side, but hi baby. Yeah, hi. Hi baby. After many weeks of hoping, waiting, listening, scouting, hiking, and climbing, the new falcon named Stryker was brought home. But even day one with his brand new fuzzy falcon friend, the ominous flags he observed in the process were heavy on his mind. There, there is a point that you have to say, you know, hiking up there and I'm exhausted and I've got uh, knee braces on and ankle braces on and all that kind of stuff. Is it really safe for me to do this? And, and so this is the first time in my more than 50 years I did not repel down the cliff and, and choose my own baby. 
And, and so through this whole process, you know, I was um, feeling a little bad that I really wanted this opportunity to, to fly mail. This will most likely be the last um, large falcon that I will fly for the rest of my life. You know, if all goes well, he'll live, you know, 20, 30 years. And, and I, will, I will have long since retired from falconry by then. Stryker grew quickly, growing stronger and stronger. Even as the joys and vigors of the tough little falcon comforted Martin, they also served to illuminate another red flag. As Stryker grew bigger and better, Martin grew worse and worse. The story of Stryker wasn't shared on our YouTube channel until August, a couple of months later. The publication of the video quickly brought up another red flag feedback from concerned friends about Martin's struggles on the climb. Their concerns, as well as his own growing worries, would finally get the horrible patient ready to face the doctor's office. For the last three years or so, uh, I've been kind of slowly going downhill. And, um, you know, I went out um, this spring and I did a, a an awful lot of backcountry hiking and hiking up cliffs and mountains and, you know, looking, monitoring falcon nesting sites. And uh, to me, it became very, very obvious that I was having some, uh, some severe health problems. And that walk generally would take me about 10 to 15 minutes. If I took my time 15 minutes, I went quickly, it would take me about 10 minutes. Um, that walk, that last walk that I did up that hill uh, took me about an hour and I could only take a, about a dozen steps and I had to stop and I had to catch my breath and I was having some real breathing problems uh, and it wasn't just there, but it was basically everywhere. And I was having some mild chest pains. And so I set up an appointment for a follow-up visit to my general practitioner I received an email, and I won't give out his name because I'm not—I don't have his permission. But there was a, a a cardiologist who has been following us on YouTube for for a number of years and loves what we do. And this cardiologist from Florida sent me an email, um, you know, wanting to know, you know, why I wasn't in the hospital. You know, you know, am I getting? These, these issues taken care of because he was quite certain that I had, um, you know, severe cardiac disease. And so I took that email that I received and went to my doctor's appointment with my general practitioner. And I explained everything to him again, that I was concerned with all of this. And by the way, here, here's a letter from a cardiologist in Florida that thinks that I'm in real trouble um, and, and, and here's the test that he, the test that he wants us to take to, to find out what's going on. In addition to the email, Martin also showed the doctor a clip from his climb up the hill. They were enough to expedite a referral to a cardiologist. So in September, as Stryker learned to fly, Martin met with the cardiologist and scheduled many, many more tests. While waiting for his test results, he was ordered by his doctors, his wife, and his nurse daughter to take it easy. I'm not even flying my hawk or my eagle uh, because that's, that requires a higher fitness level than, than I am capable of doing at this moment. And so uh, Bell and Scout are on vacation and I feel very bad for them because I, you know, this is, this is our hunting season and I really want to get out there and, and enjoy them. But um, I am behaving myself. I am flying my new Falcon. The new Falcon's name is Stryker. And the nice thing about the Falcon is I just drive out to the open desert. I pick up Stryker. I take off his hood. I turn him loose. 
Stryker flies beautifully. He's doing such a great job. He, he climbs up in the sky between 500 and 900 feet. And he covers miles of ground. And so I have to monitor him on, on my GPS system because he's quite often completely out of sight. And then when he's coming back overhead, you know, I, I flush out pigeons and he will dive vertically. He can reach speeds of close to 200 miles an hour. And he tries to catch the pigeon. If he doesn't catch a pigeon, I whistle for him. Swing my lure. He flies back, lands at my feet. I pick him up. I feed him his breakfast. And I quietly walk back to the car. So that's not too, too strenuous for me. After about a month of flying striker and hanging around at home with Scout the Golden Eagle, Bell the Harris Hawk, and Helen the Peregrine Falcon, the results from the tests came in. and um, kind of read the test results and we kind of went through them together. And he says, um, even though your test results are not good, you've got four blockages. The worst blockage looks like 60%, but he was quite convinced that, that it was significantly worse than that. And he wanted me to um, get in for an angiogram as soon as possible. So he contacted um, the hospital in St. George, which is 60 miles away, and um, he and he helped expedite the, the process to get me into the hospital and get me an angiogram, get us get the stent run through my arteries into my heart, where they could go look around in my heart. This is, this is what they found um, that was of the biggest concern. Uh, the, the blockage to the heart was um, 40 millimeters long. Not only was it 75% blockage, but 40 millimeters long. And um, the, uh, the concerning thing was that it was so long and so big and, and enough blockage that something really had to be done. As you see, it's, it's really blocking a, a major portion of the heart and stopping the blood flow. And so, you know, I'm, I'm on the operating table and they don't have you put out. They have you, um, you know, kind of sedated a little bit, but you're, you're, you're still completely awake because they wanted to be able to talk to you if they need to. And so I'm just kind of laying there quietly and they're doing the, the process. And I hear the surgeon, you know, ask one of his assistants or somebody that was there with him, um, you know, do we have a stent that's a 40 millimeter stent that we can put in this guy? And the, and the person responded back says, says I, I don't know. You know, that's an awfully big stent. And and so the doctor basically, the surgeon basically says, well, 
uh, if we don't have a stent big enough, then we'll, we'll have to start to prep him um, for bi bypass surgery. And that would have been really bad. You know, I got home two, two days after I got home from the hospital. Um, I woke up that morning and I rolled over and I said, Susan, there's something wrong. I don't feel bad. And I just felt normal. I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't having breathing problems. I wasn't, I, I wasn't feeling horribly exhausted. I was feeling more like a normal human being. You know, I, I asked um, the cardiologist and I, and I asked the physical therapist and everybody, I says, you know, I love cycling and, and I've done, you know, 100 mile bike races. Uh, and I haven't been able to do that for a few years because I kept getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And, and it just got to the point where I stopped riding my bike. And it got, got to the point where I was having a difficult time being fit enough to hunt with my hawk and my eagle. And, and I, so I asked the doctor, I says, you know, in June, they have a 100-mile bike race that's local. And I would love to do that. And they kind of looked at me like I was insane. But it's not that I want to win a bike race because I never, I've never won a bike race in my life. That's not what, what you do it for. But to be able to, uh, to, to get on my bike and, and comfortably ride 100 miles, you know, would convince me that I'm back. Again, I am so grateful to you guys. You guys, um, I, I know you care and I know you've been concerned. And so I just wanted you to know that, that we are doing everything possible uh, to make sure that, that Susan and I are, are being healthy and, and going to live a long life. With falconry, it, the art is to have the best of both worlds, to, to have the opportunity to have these birds be wild and hunt and fly and be wild falcons and eagles and hawks, but yet to be able to have the, uh, them, like Helen here, you know, very, very comfortable in captivity and, um, and be able to have that personal relationship with these animals that that most people will not only never be able to have, but most people could not even possibly understand. Yeah, I and, think a, a big misunderstanding with falconry is that you're you're keeping the bird captive, but actually you're letting the bird go all the time. Yeah, yeah, virtually, um, especially during the hunting season, virtually daily, the bird is free to leave and never come back. And, and my Golden Eagle Scout is a great example of that. We get Scout out flying, we do fly him through the courtship season. If he finds a pretty little lady eagle that's cuter than I am, he will fly away and never come back. And that's his right. I do not own him. Um, you know, I serve him well. Last Friday, we uh, took Stryker out, just like we always do. And we turned him loose and he flew beautifully. And after he was getting his altitude, and here comes a raven. And like I said, he's beat up a lot of ravens. Here comes a raven to pick on Stryker, and and Stryker actually never went after anything that didn't come after him first. And so here's this raven. The raven's looking for a fight, and Stryker is more than happy to give it to him. And Stryker is going after this raven and driving the raven to the north, and here's three more ravens that join the first raven in the fight. And so I'm watching this aerial combat going on between Stryker and four ravens, and, um, you know, he, he's, he's not going to come back until he's settled the score. And he basically um, got control of the sky. The other ravens broke off and, and left, and Stryker comes back. And I'm going, wonderful. So once, once the ravens uh, broke off and Stryker comes back with his 
altitude, absolutely perfect. He's he's more than 500 feet in the air. Everything, he's right overhead where he should be. It's now time to uh, to flush a, uh, a pigeon for him. And so I flush the pigeon, the pigeon goes up, and Stryker does his beautiful vertical stoop. And, you know, it was spectacular to watch him. And he went and started chasing after two or three stoops on the pigeon. The pigeon flew off to the west. And he was going after the pigeon for, to the west. And they, and they flew out of sight, which is not uncommon. So I've got my GPS, I've got my tablet, and I'm watching the tracking on the tablet as to, as to exactly where Stryker is. And at, at this point, he's, he's about a mile north of me, or about a mile northwest of me. And, um, and so I can see him break off from the pigeon, which is wonderful, and that he's going to start coming back. And then I start to see lots and lots of, of aerial maneuvers. I, I see a lot, of, a lot of little turns and twists and going different directions on the GPS, which pretty much means that, that um, he's, again, in combat. That, that he that he is fighting with somebody else. Now they're quite a ways beyond my my sight, um, you know. So I, I'm swinging the lure now, trying to coax him back, and I'm watching the uh, the the screen on the on the iPad, and um, and he I see him break off, and he's now he's flying straight west, and um, away from us. I, I you know I can't I don't know what's going on or what's happening. And as he's going west, um, he's starting to go down uh, and I lose signal. And so the, the, I, on this tracking system, it, I get the last point of reference on the GPS as to where he is. And so I, I, I start um, uh, as fast as I dare. Um, a very, very brisk walk uh, across the desert. There's no roads that'll get us anywhere near that area. And so a very brisk walk across the desert as fast as I can go. Again, I can't run, but I can walk briskly. And I've been, you know, I've been doing physical therapy and I've been exercising because of my heart situation. But, and I'm, I'm making good time. I'm getting across the desert and I covered a mile. I've covered two, two miles is getting three miles and I don't have a signal. And I'm really concerned, you know, what's happened to Stryker. He's not in the sky. He's on the ground. Obviously, something's wrong. And I'm going going where, where the last point of reference is on the screen, heading that direction. And it took me about an hour. And, and I, the last 15 minutes, I pick up a signal from his transmitter. And so now I've got him pinpointed exactly where he is. And again, I'm going just as quickly as I possibly can across the desert in uh, sagebrush and rabbit brush that's, um, you know, shoulder high and, and uh, you know, pretty tough terrain going up and down through, you know, little gullies and those kinds of things across the desert. And I get to, to the location where Stryker is, and he's there, and he's standing on the ground. And he he's a little disheveled. He's... Some feathers are out of place, but he's alive and he's fine. And, and so I, you know, quietly walk up to him. And normally when he first sees me and I'm, you know, 10, 15 feet away, he starts to call to me. No call. He's just sitting quietly. And so I've got food on my glove and I reach down and I pick him up on, onto the glove. And he's, he's obviously, he's, he's not feeling good. And, and so we um, start walking the oh, three, four miles back to the car and I've got food for him and he's starting to eat, but he's eating kind of quietly, but he's eating. And I'm going, okay, well, you've had a really rough day, my little friend, let's get you home. Uh, this flight was uh, over 13 miles. And so, you know, he nearly tripled his normal distance that he was flying and flying hard and he was flying against um, you know, a lot of other animals and he exerted himself. So, so my hope was that he was just exhausted. So we kept him under observation for the rest of the day. And I put him out in his chamber 
for the evening. The next morning, I walk out, and he's calling to me, and I'm going, okay, good. And I walk out with his breakfast, and I feed him. And, um, you know, he you could tell he he was probably sore. He just wasn't he wasn't his, himself, but he was being active and pretty well normal. And so I brought him back in the house and put him on the perch for observation. And he was with us the whole day. And like I said, he, he ate well, and things uh, looked okay. And, you know, I, I gave him a, a complete physical and I, you know, checked every place where the feathers were disheveled and, and stuff and looking for any signs of injuries. I, there was no blood. I, I, you know, the feathers are thick and hard to see through, but, you know, he looked okay. So we put him away, everything was fine. And then Sunday morning, we, we walked out and, you know, giving everybody food and stuff. And I didn't hear Stryker. And so I opened the door of his chamber and walked in. And Stryker was on the ground and he was dying. He obviously got uh, punctured, though I couldn't find any blood. He obviously got punctured. There is nothing more, there's nothing worse than bird of prey talons. The, the bacteria that's on those talons are just horrifying. You know, um, you, know you get grabbed by, a, by these, these talons right here and they puncture in, you can get blood poisoning quite quickly. In fact, I almost lost my right arm to an infection when I got grabbed by, by an eagle. And so it's incredibly infectious. I, I picked up Stryker, I brought him in the house, and, and he was passing away. Um, so um, Sunday was a really bad day. And, and so, you know, we, we miss my little friend This is a story that um, that every falconer needs to understand. That um, you you bring you you bring these birds into our captivity, and and they have this umbrella of protection with us. Um, that means that they're going to live um, twice as long, three times as long as normal. Um, which is for me is absolutely wonderful, but the minute they they leave this glove, they are subject to all of the same dangers as any wild hawk, falcon, or eagle is subjected to. And and that is a risk that that you have to be willing to accept. Um, so it's been a it's been a hard week for. For me, I have uh, spent quite a while visiting with my friends. One of my when I lose one of my one of my critters, I uh, I don't talk to people. I talk to Scout, talk to Helen, talk to Bell. Um, spend a lot of time alone. The wild is an incredibly incredibly dangerous place for all of these animals. This is why I say 80% of them don't survive the first year. Um, yes, rouse. This is a lesson that um, especially falconers need to understand and, and actually the general public needs to understand as well that, um, you know, that as, as beautiful as this is our planet is this bright blue ball in the middle of a cosmos that uh, is so vast that we can't possibly understand it. Um, this beautiful planet is can be incredibly cruel, um, and and you know we will all we will all suffer losses and. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I've lost my little, my little friend. I know, I know one of the questions I'll be asked, you know, will you get another bird? And the question will be yes. 
Um, I will not get another striker. That doesn't mean I won't get another Peregrine. I will because there will be their individuals. So there will be there will be no other striker. Um, but understanding the process and the gifts that I've received from a lifetime of of this work. Um, you know, this is far too valuable to to uh, say no, that uh, that I quit. And, uh, you know, we have, yes, you're such a sweet girl. And, uh, and again, I have to be here. I've got to take care of these critters. You know, I have to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to rescue the sick, injured, and orphaned. And, and so, you know, we have to be able to move past this. I have the right to feel bad for a, for a few days. And we do have one more issue to address, and that's when you went to uh, get him after his last big brawl, you walked three miles briskly through the desert, and you walked three miles back. And how did you feel the next day? Um, fortunately, other than a little tired, um, you know, my heart is doing fine. Um, prior to uh, my my uh, stent surgery that I had, prior prior to that, um, it probably would have been a four or five hour walk. I, I and I would have had to stop many many times. May have had to have gotten someone to help um, to uh, to actually take the walk for me. Uh, so, um, you know, the arteries in my heart, they're, they're opened up, my heart's getting blood and, uh, and I, like I said, I've been doing my physical therapy and, and so from that perspective, uh, I, I'm doing much, much better and thank you everybody for caring. This is a male prairie falcon. This is our native desert falcon that we have here. And um, yes, you are. You're my baby, huh? I saved this little guy twice from a wild golden eagle. Um, like I said, these, these guys are always subject to lots of dangers out in the wild. You know, we, we desperately miss Stryker. Um, of all the falcons that I've had, uh, Stryker ranked in the top three of, of all, all of the falcons that I've flown. He was just a marvelous, marvelous bird, and we loved him to death. Um, and, and so this gives me, instead of sitting around the house all winter long just doing chores and that kind of stuff, um, now we're going to get out every day and start to get this little guy uh, exercised and, and, and handled and flown. It, it just really, people don't understand how much joy these animals bring me. They really give me a reason to kind of get up in the morning and, and, and get to work.